Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello friends, in today's lecture we will introduce a new topic which is called memory. <coughs> so, continuing from what we learned in the last classes, uh, perception, attention, the next step into any cognitive process is memory. So, what is memory? Uh, I have given a uh, uh, definition of it, not kind of a definition, but I I have given what memory comprise of in the title of this slide. So, it says uh, memory is something uh, which is equivalent to knowing something or remembering th something and this is very cleverly put here because one of the debates in memory is uh, something called the know or remember debate which is uh, a debate about how long term memory stores things or uh, what is the way in which long term memory uh, processes information. So, what is memory? Before we uh, go into explaining what memory is, I have some funny cartoons here for you to look at, which will give you uh, some idea or which will slightly entertain you into understanding what memory is. And so, you can see on the right hand of your slide, a person uh, who is into a, a chamber of a therapist and uh, therapist asks uh, something about or uh, this therapist is doing uh, psychotherapy and so he asks something about uh, whether he remembers the person who is the patient remembers the therapist or not and the patient denies it and the therapist only worry is whether he remembers uh, the therapist because if he does not remember the therapist then no amount of money is what comes out of the pocket of uh, the person and the therapy, which basically means that the therapist does not get paid. And so, uh, in a very brief way, uh, this is what memory encompasses of. On the right hand side, you see another interesting uh, uh, figure, interesting uh, cartoon, which tells you a little bit about what memory is. And so, this is uh, uh, a demonstration of uh, the famous uh, uh, remember no paradigm uh, by an, uh, and will tell me and what this says is that uh, the, the person in question is asking the cat uh, whether uh, the cat remembers what she saw was a mouse or whether she knows what she uh, whether it was a mouse or not. And so, this distinction between remembering and uh, knowing something and remembering something. Uh, is a famous debate in memory studies and we will take up this debate when we come to uh, the, the section on long term memory. So, let us start with uh, understanding what memory is. So, let me put a question to you. Uh, do you remember the last ball uh, which was hit for a 6 in the 2011 cricket world cup? And as soon as I put this question to you, most people do remember because it was a proud moment for India. India won the World Cup in uh, cricket in 2011 and the last ball uh, was Mohinder Singh Dhoni hitting a 6 to win the World Cup. And so, when, when I ask you this question, many information comes in front of you like the process that I am doing right now, when I am trying to uh, tell you what happened on that day is actually memory. So, mostly the way we look at memory, the way uh, most lay persons look at memory, the concept of memory is about retrieval. So, memory is a process of retrieval and when we say uh, do you remember something or uh, do you uh, uh, un, uh, think you know something, these are all facts about memory. So, then the main uh, idea about memory or the main uh, uh, 
the uh, main feature of memory is uh, retrieval. So, how do we define memory? Now, think about the first day you came to your present college wherever you are studying. You came to the college, you met a lot of uh, new friends, you did a lot of things and when I ask you to remember the first day that you came to your college, several experiences will be uh, competing with each other to come to your uh, uh, consciousness, to come to your uh, mind and these ideas or these facts which are competing with each other is what is called memory. And so, memory is that particular thing or memory is that particular feature of cognition which brings to mind or which uh, focuses on or puts into consciousness information which has been learned before. And the information that has been learned before has passed has already passed to two important cognitive stages which is uh, the first stage of perception where information is coded on or information is processed from raw stimuli to the uh, to the process of sensation and perception and the next stage where attention another cognitive process is applied onto the raw information which comes up to perception and then whatever is to be remembered or whatever has to be stored is put onto the focus. So, then memory is the process of basically storing something and retrieving it. So, because before you retrieve something it has to be stored somewhere and so another uh, dimension or another uh, fact that can be added to memory is the storage fact. So, basically speaking then memory in general layman's term is a process of storing something of uh, retrieving something and we add one more feature to it which is basically called uh, to process something. So, basically encoding something, storing something and retrieving it back is what is called memory in very generic terms. So, uh, the definition in a slide would say that it is memory is a most basic process which is used in our daily life. And right from the time that you uh, uh, wake up to the time that you go to bed, you do a lot of things, you undergo a lot of acts you undertake a lot of work and most of this work requires you to access information from uh, your mental storage and this mental storage the process of storing and process of retrieving information <coughs> from your mental storage is what is called memory. Now, the question is why is memory needed? So, as we saw memory is a three part process it starts with encoding it leads to storage and it further leads to something called retrieval of information from uh, the store where you uh, where people store it. So, why is memory needed at all? What is the reason why memory is needed? And so, the appreciation of memory the, the uh, real regard for memory will not come to uh, anyone until and unless he sees someone or a person sees someone who has no memory. And so, people who do not have memory are called amenics. So, you have uh, something called amnesia a disorder of memory where people cannot or are not able to remember anything. And there are two kinds of amnesia to look at one is called the retrograde and the other is called antograde in which uh, most of these amnesias, fo uh, amnesias focus on the fact that in one of it you people are not able to form present memories which basically means they are not able to form memories of whatever is happening right now and in retrograde amnesia people not able to retrieve memory from the mental store. So, in one case there is an encoding failure. So, people are not able to form memory in the other case they are not able to retrieve memory and so until and unless you come or you see a person who has no memory the appreciation of memory is very difficult. I am saying this because memory is something which most people take for granted it is there and so we do not appreciate it anymore till the point of time that it goes away. And so, a beautiful case study is defined by Alan Bradley of a person called Clive Wearing who had no STM, no short term memory. We basically mean that he had a type of amnesia in which this person was not able to form 
memory of to encode something new. And so, this person's amnesia Alan Bradley goes on to say was so dense that even if you talk to this person, even if you are talking to this person, he will talk to you for 2 minutes and within 2 minutes he will forget you. So, think of a life of a person where this where anybody cannot remember you or cannot remember any information for more than 2 or 3 minutes. Now, it is really a hell of a life because it will be very difficult to live a life like that because what would happen is that you would not be able to uh, generate, you will be, you would not be able to encode or you would not be able to store something new. And this person had a kind of amnesia where, he, where the initial memory or uh, the present memory could not be encoded. So, if questions were asked to him, were put to him about facts which uh, were prior to uh, the phase when he suffered this amnesia. So, his amnesia developed because of accident. So, those facts or those information which was stored which he was aware of uh, before his accidents they were perfectly intact, but he was not able to uh, go ahead and, uh, uh, and actually uh, remember something which was happening right now. And so, this particular case uh, uh, could be used as a reference for what is the uh, the uh, highlight of memory or what is the meaning of memory. The question is what are the various ways in which memory has been explained uh, in by philosophers. Now, since psychology moved out of philosophy and a lot of philosophers a lot of views of philosophers are carried on to it. So, a lot of philosophers have also uh, said a lot of things about what memory is. And so, there are several models, there are several definitions which have been there, which has uh, been explained, which have been used to explain what memory is. And so, let us quickly discuss some of these metaphors or some of these um, models, which have been proposed by various philosophers or various scientists working into uh, the science of memory. And so, uh, Plato uh, Ian Neath 1988 points out that Plato wrote about memory by comparing it to something called an avery or a wax tablet on which an impression are made. So, what Plato said is memory is like a wax tablet where you make certain impression and when you do not need it these impressions are taken away or it is molded back. And so, most memory is like a wax uh, and so, you take a a pen or a chisel and heat it and make some kind of a mark onto this wax and that is what memory is. Similarly, in the middle <coughs> ages several other conceptualizations of memory were done and some of these conceptualizations led to the idea that memory could also be compared to a cave, an empty cabinet, a storage house and so on and so forth. So, memory mostly uh, these uh, studies or these uh, viewpoints of memory are all talking about memory as a storage system, because retrieval is a process. So, retrieval accesses a storage. So, when I say think about something, the process that you use, uh, the way that you uh, get information is what is called retrieval, but from where you get is what is called storage part of memory. And so, uh, the memory in itself is uh, defined in terms of this philosophical studies or in this uh, in terms of these old studies as a system which stores information. So, basically then the question here is whether memory is a single store system which means that are information stored in one typical way or whether there are different stores and uh, the memory is stored in different ways. So, from very early on this philosophers knew that there are 5 sense organs and since uh, the number of sense organs are different is basically 5 all of them would produce a different input which is not similar to the uh, input from another sense organs which basically means that the number of memory stores have to be more than 1. And so, that is one of the debate that how many stores are there and so, we will quickly come to that idea of when uh, how memory has been defined in terms of the storage idea. Also, how is memory uh, arranged? So, how do you access memory? So, 
is memory like a box which is full of a number of items. So, think of your closet uh, back in your hostel. Now, most of you would have a disorganized closet and so what would happen is on one uh, particular uh, garment, the other garment would go on and so a number of dresses will go over it and in the middle of it there will be books and so many things would be there in your closet, which means that a disorganized closet. Now, if a disorganized closet is there, searching anything from it is difficult. So, then how is memory organized? What is the way in which memory is organized? So, are there ordered structures of organizing memory or are there unordered structures? And so, if there are ordered structures, how are they accessed? How, uh, what is stored? How much information is stored? All these questions we look into in the upcoming several weeks in several different definitions of what memory is and so, we will discuss it there. But for now, the idea here is that people who followed uh, from the trends of philosophy or people in the middle ages, they had this idea of cave or cabinet or uh, empty house kind of a thing of memory, which suggests that they thought of memory as a store house. Now, in the 1950s and in the 1960s, in the 1950s particularly, the telephone came in, Graham Bell has already invented the telephone system and so memory was then compared as uh, to the telephone system, which uh, was supposed of interconnected uh, uh, wires from a central node. And so, in, in uh, those days in the 1950s, the telephone system was compared to the memory. So, how one connection leads to another connection and there is a central node which goes ahead and makes this connection is what memory was thought of. So, different bits of information comes from encoding and different bits of information are retrieved and the one area which is connecting it is called the central node and that is where or, or it is it's, uh, uh, it's, it's called uh, the control center, where people or telephone operators sit and manage telephone calls. The similar way, memory is thought of similar way. So, telephone, there, is, there is a central operator who actually sits there, takes in information which, which comes in from through perception attention and this is called uh, the incoming call kind of a uh, issue and this is encoding. And then, the telephone operator takes this information and whenever needed passes this information out, which is equivalent to the concept of retrieval. And so, this operator then manages this information and so, in those days this is how that uh, memory was uh, thought of and this is how the uh, analogy was developed. Now, in the 1960s, uh, the first computers were generated and in those days uh, from that idea onwards, memory started being thought of as a computer system, which has an input which has a throughput and which has an output. So, uh, uh, right from uh, the point where it was thought of for the cave to the development of the telephone system to the development of the computers, the idea of memory kept on changing from one generation to the another generation. Now, uh, in the 60s and 70s, when the first computerized model or computer model of memory came in. Uh, a lot of information was gathered by people working in this area and some of the primary information that they gathered was that there were multiple kind of memories. So, for the first time people came to know that there was different kind of memories. So, even within a particular uh, sensory organ. So, I am not talking about whether different sensory organ uh, brings in different kind of memory, what I am talking here is that within a specific sense organ also we had different kinds of memories and also the fact that not only uh, there are different kind of memories in terms of uh, a particular sensory organ, it is also that these memories have a particular duration, a duration for which they last. So, there are certain stores or there are certain terms for certain kind of memories which last for a very short period of time and then there are certain kind of memories which long which are uh, there which are available for longer period of time. And so, these kind of options or these kind of studies uh, started developing and that was the time when memory studies the full form of memory studies came into uh, being. So, uh, with the advent of uh, the computers and the, with, the ad, with the additional knowledge of uh, uh, the fact that memories are 
of different kind and they have different time periods to be stored, they require different time periods to be stored, they are accessible for different time periods. An important breakthrough happened in the research of memory and a model was developed which is called the modal model of memory as you can see. Now, this model of memory uh, suggests that information which is passed on from uh, the perceptual processes and through the attentional processes these uh, arrive at something called the sensory register uh, uh, kind of a buffer where uh, which has a property of storing a lot of information. And from there on depending on certain features of the sensor register, uh, depending on certain other mental uh, and cognitive processes, these information are passed on to another store which is called the short term store. And from there depending on certain features of the short term store and certain active processes that has to uh, be taken uh, that has to be taken up there, memory is passed on to another kind of store which is called the long term store and that is what it talks about. So, basically a three store system was developed which is the short term store, long term store and the sensory register. So, briefly speaking then this is how memory would look like. So, the modal model of memory, uh, the modal model of memory talks about a very short store which is called the sensory memory or some books will talk about this store as the sensory register. Now, this is a buffer store, buffer store in the sense that it has several properties. So, we will look into uh, the idea of sensory registers, uh, sensory memory, long term memory, short term memory in a while, but for now let me introduce you to the modal model. And so, what it says is that at the beginning the information which has been coming, so information which is coming from perception and attention land up at this sensory register. Now, it is a buffer as I said and it is a buffer of a unique status. Why it is unique? It is unique because it can take up a lot of information, it can store a lot of information, but the information duration for which it can store information is very, very brief. And so, depending on certain features here, certain processes here, mostly attentional processes, mostly uh, attention or some person related factors also, this information is passed on to another store which is called the short term memory. We will look at as I said into most of these models or into most of these stores uh, one by one and in the upcoming lectures. And so, the short, the short term store does is, it stores information for a very, very brief period of time. So, mostly sensory register passes on information depending on certain features or certain requirements and these requirements are determined by people's attention or intention and so on and so forth. And so, this information then passes on to something called the short term memory. Short term memory is a store, it is like a cave, it is like a box which can store a lot of information, but this information is very, very limited because this attention what has uh, this attentional filter over here has limited the number of information which passes to the short term store. So, limited number of information can be assessed to this store, but then the idea here is that this information can st stay here for longer period of time. It is equivalent to remembering a, a phone number while talking to a friend, so that kind of a thing. And so, from here there is another store which is called the long term store where information can move out to. So, depending on whether you repeat the stimulus sub vocally, which basically means whether you do a rehearsal of the stimulus. So, whatever information comes from the sensory register to the short term store, whether you rehearse this information or not, whether you go ahead and repeat this information or not, that will decide whether it goes to long term store or not. The long term store has a property that it can store a number of information into it. And so, a number of information for extensive period of time. So, that kind of structure is uh, what is called the long term store and this is the modal uh, model of uh, 
memory it is akin to or similar to Atkinson and Schrieffen's model, but then Atkinson and Schrieffen has several more addition to it. We will talk about the Atkinson and Schrieffen model and another model which is the Craig and Lockhart model in a while. So, let me just introduce you these things uh, here. So, there are two models one is called the Craig and Lockhart model and the Atkinson and Schrieffen model. <coughs> now, the question was whether memory is a single store system or a multiple store system and that was what the debate is and that is the debate which will be solved by the Atkinson and Schrieffen model and the uh, Craig and Lockhart model. So, we will come to that when we uh, come there. So, the question now is how do we experimentally prove that this is right that this kind of a store appears that this kind of a store structure is there in memory and for there that particular thing a number of experiment a number of free recall experiments were done and what was these experiments like. So, in this free recall experiment a list of words were given to people. So, these are number of words which are given to people and they were asked to remember these to learn these by heart and later on they were asked to retrieve these back these words back and to basically go ahead and retrieve, retrieve or to uh, uh, tell me these uh, words back or uh, repeat these words back to me uh, and they do not have to follow any sequence that is why it is called a free recall there, there is no sequence that they, they follow. So, even even if uh, the fact that they can remember word number 10 first and word number ten, uh, ten, uh, 2 second and so on and so forth. So, they are free to recall the way they want to the only thing here is that they have to first learn a list and then retrieve a list back. Now, an interesting thing was found out here when this retrieval the percentage accuracy of retrieval and this is the time dimension when this kind of thing was plotted something like this was found and this basically. So, these are the uh, I am sorry this is not the time dimension this is the list items items of the list. And so, what was found out is that this kind of curve which is called the serial position curve was what was evident from the results. So, what is the serial position curve? So, on this axis you have uh, the probability of recall and this uh, on this axis you have uh, the list of items which has to be recalled and this is what you tend to get. So, what does this list actually tell you? So, this list basically tells you or this kind of a graph basically goes ahead and tells you that these are items which are at the beginning of the list and these are items which are at the end of the list. So, let us say in a 30 word list these are item number 30, 29, 28, 27 and these are items number 1, 2, 3, 4 and 5 and here is item number let us say um, 18, 17, 15, 16 kind of a thing. What is the meaning of all this? The meaning of all this is that items present at the top of the list those items which are presented towards the beginning of the list are remembered more and similarly items which have been presented towards the end of the list are remembered more which basically means that these two kind of items have a preferential or have pre, uh, more better memory. Why? they have better memory. This kind of effect where items which have been learned at the beginning of the list are remembered more is called the primacy effect and this kind of thing where items which have been remembered from the end of the list is called the recency effect. So, what psychologists when they did experiments like this they found out that this kind of effect was there and this kind of effect basically means that there are two memory stores. These memory stores the one which is storing this and the one which is storing this are entirely different. The reason being that this words are being remembered 
because people rehearse. So, when a list is given to you, the top of the list items, these are being rehearsed, these are being repeated. So, item number 1, you first learn it, you repeat it, then you learn item 2, then you repeat item 1 and then item 2, again you learn item number 3. So, you repeat item number 1, item number 2 and you repeat item number 3, and then fourth item comes in and then you repeat item number 1, 2, 3, 4. So, the number of repetitions that item number 1 gets is multiplied by this factor. And so, they what happened is this primary if primacy effect hap is happening because of retrieval. Whereas, the recency effect is happening because people tend to say when people were questioned why do you remember list or what happened actually when they remembered uh, items from the end of the list. They thought or they basically replied back saying that they could still hear the list, they could still hear the words ringing in the ears which basically means that some kind of recency was happening. And so, this proposal then says that there are two different kinds of memories. One memory which stores information which has been repeated and another memory which stores information which has not been repeated. And since these items have not been repeated at all, they have not been processed at all, they form another class or another domain and these form another domain or another class. And so, this is um, call the short term memory and this part is called the long term memory and this is one of the basic demonstrations or one of the basic uh, experiments to show that a structure of short term and long term memory exists and which basically means that memory is a multi modal store. So, another thing was found out that uh, uh, to, uh, to basically verify recency was that another interesting thing was done and what was done is that a list of words. So, whether recency happens because people hear words or people hear uh, the fading of your words whether that is the reason for recency or not to test this a list of words were read very very fast. So, a list of words were read very fast, so that there was no time for rehearsal. And so, when there was no time for rehearsal in those cases, there was no primacy effect, but still recency effect, which means that people did remember words toward the end of the list. You do hear at times that something, some information it broadcasted very fast. So, the end of the list information still stays with you and that is what is uh, called recency. But then if time enough is given, then you have both the primacy and the recency effect coming in. Uh, to this and that basically is the idea of something called uh, the modal model of memory or the idea that there are different stores of memory. And so, you can see as this uh, particular uh, graph shows you this is a bottom memory system. So, you see there is something called the sensory register. So, stimuli from the world it impinges on to the sensory register it is a buffer and these are the properties of it. There is quick scan for importance and pre coding these are the features of this kind of a thing. So, information also in addition information stays here for a very very brief period of time. So, something around 1 second and then the information here which is stored is huge information. So, huge amount of information is stored here. Also, there is something called short term memory or presently in these days it is called working memory. So, we will introduce you, I will introduce you to the concept of what is working memory and what is the difference between working and sensory memory in the later half of this chapter. So, the idea here is that there is another store which is called working memory and the features of this store is coding, rehearsal, recoding and so on and so forth. And similarly, there is a third store which is called the long term store which has the features of processing, storing and recalling. And so, we will discuss this whole idea of this is basically a, a quick view of attention and reference view uh, of idea of memory. We will come back to this. In, in a while when we discuss uh, the Atkinson and Schiffen view about memory. So, very briefly then if you look into here we have something called sensory register, working memory and long term memory. So, then let us for the sake of consistency start with the first type of memory. Ex let me explain you a little bit about what it is, how does it work and what are the features of this and then we will quickly move into working memory. So, in the present section we will look into sensory register and working memory, in the next section we will look into long term memory. So, let us quickly go into what is sensory memory. So, what is sensory memory? Most people generally look at sensory memory as a record of your percept. Let me give you an example of what sensory memory is. Most of you have looked at displays or your uh, professors who are teaching you. And so, uh, 
suppose a professor is going ahead and testing whether the slide projects or not and so he quickly projects something and then takes it back you do see some form of information or you do see an image of the slide fading away very fast this percept or this particular feeling where you see images fading very fast is what is called uh, the sensory memory and this is called this is kind of an iconic sensory memory it is since it is visual in nature it is called an iconic sensory memory. So, basically that is what uh, and so uh, sensory memory is basically what is equivalent to the percept or what we people call it um, uh, in terms of perception. Now, it is a record of a percept because it refers to initial brief storage of information where you might retain after a quick glance to an object field. So, think of looking or quickly glancing. So, quickly glance towards the room and then move back this just like something I did. And so, when you start thinking about what you saw you will see uh, or you will basically what comes to mind is a fading image of something which lies behind you and that is what is called the sensory memory. So, it is a memory which is there with you for a very very brief period of time holds a lot of information, but the problem is that most information that it holds is, is unprocessed form and so cannot be processed and so uh, attention and perception decides whether information passes from here to uh, the next stages of memory. So, sensory memory exists and, and another interesting thing is that we have different kind of sensory memory. So, five different senses, five different sensory memory are there although the sensory memory for taste is a, a little bit gustatory memory is a little bit uh, I would not say that fast, but then most memories are um, uh, follow some kind of a rule or some kind of a adherence to each other. And so, for visual we have the icon as a sensory memory, for auditory we have the eco and for touch we have the haptic and for the sake of consistency, for the sake of easiness since this is not a very extensive course. So, we will just look at the icon and eco as a um, demonstration of sensory memory. So, the first kind of sensory memory uh, that we have is called the icon. Now, icon is a sensory memory for the image or it is an, an, an uh, visual sensory memory. So, then what is the icon? So, Nicer 1967 called icon a very brief visual memory. It is a sensory memory uh, storage system for visual materials holding information up to 1 second. So, as, as I said sensory memories have very very less time availability. So, uh, information is available in sensory memories for very brief period of time, but it can hold huge information a huge number of information which comes up through the uh, perception process. And so, what happens here is that most information is available, but since the time period for which it is available is very less you cannot look at it. So, one of the features of uh, an uh, sensory memory is that it can hold a lot of information for, but for a very very brief period of time. And so, the demonstration that I just told you uh, in terms of looking at something a quick glance onto something or quickly glancing up or looking uh, uh, at something which is presented for a very very brief period of time the fading image is what is an icon. So, icon is equivalent to that fading image which uh, which moves out which leaves you and it, it fades away quickly that is what icon is and that represents uh, the, the iconic uh, memory. So, the best demonstration of iconic memory was done using something called uh, Sperling's partial report technique in 1960. And uh, Averill and Corel, Ever, Everback and Corel showed that icons can be raised by the stimuli presented immediately after the icon. We will we'll, uh, I will show you how this happens through something called masking, which basically means that uh, an icon or a sensory memory or the visual nature, uh, it, it is there, it is in front of you for a very brief period of time, uh, but if something uh, in the time period that the icon is presented is something else is presented a masking stimuli, a stimuli which goes ahead and hides this icon for, uh, for a brief period of time and an interference will happen and the icon disappears, but we will come back to that in a minute. So, then how do I test? 
for the presence of an icon. How do I test that iconic memory is present or not? And for this, a very interesting experiment was done by Sperling. And what this experiment was in very brief terms, I will try and explain you. Uh, it's called the whole versus part uh, uh, report, whole, whole versus partial report technique. So, the demonstration looks something like this. In uh, this demonstration, what happens is most subjects who come for this demonstration first sees a central fixation point like this. So, you this is the central fixation point people are asked subjects who are doing the experiment are asked to put their eye on to it. And then later on they see a matrix like this we have which have a number of uh, letters written on to it and then a blank slide is presented. So, what you really have to do after that after the blank slide is presented a tone is presented which cues you which tells you to report or to write this particular thing back. So, very simple experiment you start with focusing on this particular fixation point for 500 millisecond then a display like this is presented to you for 50 millisecond then a blank slide is presented for 0 to 5 second this is a masking stimuli this is done. So, that uh, we are sure that most stimulus that the, the image of the stimulus is um, is moved out of your uh, buffer is moved out of the sensory buffer and then a tone is there to tell you that you have to report it back. So, there are two versions of it one is called the whole report technique. Now, in the whole report technique what happened is that subjects were asked to report the whole of this and so what was seen I will quickly jump to the result. So, what was seen is that when that was done then people could at the best remember the first row of letters or if they are remembering it for this. So, maximum 4 letters is what they remembered. So, in this kind of demonstration people remembered the 4 letters and by the time they were up to the 5th letter the image disappeared and that was what was happening. So, by the time they were into the 5th and 6th the whole image of the whole stimuli disappeared as I said is a fading experience the whole thing faded and they could not report it back. So, the question was can this be helped? can this be improved and so something called a partial report technique was designed. Now, it is just an addition into it and so what was the partial report technique the same kind of structure was used for doing the experiment the only thing here was that three different tones were used. So, this was a high tone, this was a middle tone and this was a low tone. So, three different kind of tones were used and now the subjects were interested in uh, were instructed in this way. If there is a high tone you have to just remember the first row, if there is a middle tone you have to remember the second row and if there is a third uh, if there is a low tone you have to remember the third row. So, retrieve back the items from the third row. What do you think happened? In a situation like this subjects very accurately remembered the letters they were very accurate in remembering. So, when a high tone was presented they very accurately remembered all the four letters which basically means that if the first thing that it's, it says is that the sensory memory stays for a very very brief period of time and all information of sensory memory is available to you, but what happens is the storage you have. So, two uh, basic proposals of sensory memory that it can use a lot of information that it can store a lot of information, but for a brief period of time. And so, we tested both of them here. The thing is that if I present a low tone and the same image you are able to go uh, uh, remember back the third row. It basically means that the whole of the slide is, is available to you, but what happens is when you start reading it back it disappears. So, the thing is when a technique was used where you have to just remember one part of it you were able to do it. It basically means that the whole of slide information the information on the slide the whole of slide was available to people and what uh, why we were, they were not able to complete the whole report technique is because they were trying to read everything. So, one problem the other problem solved is that time duration. Now, the thing is if uh, Q was given a uh, uh, particular mid, uh, high, medium, low kind of a Q was given the time was very less and people were able to accurately finish it. So, then, but then when a whole report technique was used since the time period since the time that you require to move from one word to write these words were uh, constantly increasing. So, you were actually forgetting and so this is a very clever demonstration or very good demonstration of something called the iconic memory.
Now the thing is what kind of cues can be used. So, here I have used or here in the classic experiments Perling had used something called the tone cue. So, the question was to find out whether this iconic memory the icons what is the nature of the icons. So, is icon does icon contain categorized information which means that what is the level of information which is stored in the icon. And so, to test that queuing was done first by something called physical properties. So, brightness, color these kind of cues were used this kind of factors were used for queuing this kind of a whole report and partial report. So, with physical properties it was very very easy, but then if people were asked to report back from this kind of a structure from this kind of a slide whether they saw vowel or whether they saw consonants into this structure people were not able to uh, attain this task or finish this task which basically proves that on the information which is available here is at the very very physical level it is highly unprocessed and so this kind of a meaning related thing can be generated cannot be generated out of it. So, basically what you can do is that this kind of categorization cannot be used or uh, the category based distinction cannot be used for uh, uh, queuing. Another thing another interesting thing was that can people also uh, generate meaning from it and so as I explained that cannot be done. So, then what kind of cues can be used? So, very basic cues uh, can, can be used uh, for example, you have brightness, you have tone you have intensity of the stimulus and these can cue uh, people for the whole report and part report technique. But then things like categorization if you see a vowel report it. So, report all the words for example, report all the vowels that you see here and th that is the question which is given to you it is a dual task. First of all you have to remember what know what a vowel is and then categorize it and later on report it. So, if that kind of a task is given to you where it has certain rule certain kind of um, meaning information attached to it that information was very difficult to access that kind of task was very difficult to uh, access and and accomplished by uh, get accomplishedly done uh, by this particular uh, thing. Also one interesting thing if, if you are interested is uh, is to know that neat and superint in 2003 they found out that newer studies say that people are able to uh, prop uh, provide category information from this kind of a display, which means that category information can also be extracted from these displays. So, very recent study and then the time course of an icon is not 1 second, it is 100 and not uh, say 100 millisecond, it is 150 to 200 millisecond that is how a uh, icon is basically presented or it is available. So, let us quickly then look into a uh, 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 counterpart of the icon the auditory icon as I would say it is called the eco. So, eco is a counter uh, is is a uh, uh, is a kind of sensory memory of the auditory dimension and so nicer uh, 1967 called it the eco. So, a very interesting experiment intelligent experiment was done, uh, done by someone called Moray Bates and Barnett in 1965 to show what an uh, eco is. So, what they did was they presented subject with something called four eared listening task which is similar to uh, dichotic listening task. So, subject was centered or subjects were made to hear uh, through the two ears four different channels of uh, audio information. And so, these information and this is similar to Sperling's task. So, these information was coming from the right uh, 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 forward, the left forward, the right backward and left backward. So, similar to uh, this uh, think of it in this way. So, uh, here what happens is that a person sits here and so, he is wearing an earphone and so, this is my person who is sitting here and this is the headphone that he is wearing. So, he hears two tones one is forward uh, right, uh, forward right, forward left four channels. So, a, st uh, a stereo mixing equipment was used, used and this is backward left and this is backward right. So, he is, he is hearing these four tones. Uh, now, the thing is in the whole report technique the subject was uh, asked to report whatever he heard from all these 
different different. So, one string was presented here, one string of information was presented here, one string here, one string here. So, in the whole technique the person has to report everything that he hears from four different. So, a four channel system was there whereas, in the partial report technique what the person had to do was to report from one of these channels whether it is for, uh, forward um, uh, right, forward, left and so on and so forth. So, how do you do it? Uh, the experiment is designed in such a way that this person is actually hearing this uh, four different different sounds and then in front of him are four bulbs which represent uh, front right, front left, back right and back left. And so, one of when one of these bulbs, this is the queuing method, one of these bulb eliminates, this person has to tell what he heard from the forward right or say backward left. So, the, the elimination of these bulbs will tell you to attend to this particular channel and report back what you hear. And so, Darwin uh, uh, and Crowder 1972, they repli replicated Morris experiment with better controls and found a much uh, smaller partial report advantage. So, in this case also the experimenters found a large, uh, uh, a, a large benefit for the partial report case than for the uh, whole report ca uh, case. And so, some facts which were revealed was the echoic memory has larger capacity than iconic memory. And so, this is one interesting thing that the echo uh, stores more information than the icon. The echo stores more information. One reason could be plausible reason is that echo is a single channel system. So, uh, the words have to be stayed for more period of time. Uh, if, if I write something, let us say I write on a piece of paper Ram goes to village, this if I show you for 100 of a millisecond, uh, you will be able to understand, but until and unless I spell the whole sentence Ram goes to the village, you will not have an idea of what is happening, who is Ram, where is he going, what kind of a thing is there. So, the whole sentence has to be played and so, visuals uh, auditory systems store more information because it has to, it is a single channel system, it has to go from one word to the other word to the other word to the other word for making meaning and so that could be the reason why it stores more information. Also echo, echoes can last 20 seconds longer than icons that is what it is and so, uh, the, so uh, if icon stays for 100 millisecond echo can stay for 120 millisecond or maybe if echoes can uh, if icons can stay for 150 millisecond the echoes nearly about 200 milliseconds. So, then uh, information in the echo is huge it is unprocessed like the icon, but the idea is that it is better or it stores more information than the icon. And so, this is the next type of or second type of uh, uh, sensory memory which is there and this is a demonstration of uh, the uh, Darwin, Turvey and Corder experiment where you have left, right and so you, you do see that these are the words which have been presented. These are the items which are presented to different different uh, through different different uh, channels on the headphone and, pay, and this person who is sitting here has to report. So, sensory memory can currently then what is the definition of sensory memory can currently it can be described through these things. First, sensory memories are modality specific which means that there is a memory for visual that there is a memory for haptic senses, there is a memory for auditory senses and so on and so forth. Also, the capacities are huge, but the length of time the information can be stored is quite slow. So, huge capacity, but smaller time. So, information stays for very, very brief period of time. Also, the information can be stored up, uh, appears unprocessed. So, as we saw that category task or several other tasks which require which I if given to subjects to perform onto the icon or the eco, they are not able to do it which means that information is available, but it is not processed in any way. So, it is like simple perceptual information unprocessed the so perceptual information. So, then uh, let us look at some examples of what this is. So, for example, uh, in visual sensory memory, uh, uh, it could be that quickly take your hand and move it in front of you uh, very quick. Once you do that, you can still see your hand moving back and that is visual memory. In auditory with your hands beat a quick rhythm on the desk, you will hear a 
after eco and that is what is the echoic memory on in, in terms of tactile memory rub the palms of your hand along a horizontal surface and even when this is done when you are finished with it uh, you will still uh, have some kind of a haptic sensation a sharp edge uh, in in this case on the uh, edge of the desk and that is what is the sensory. So, we will then uh, let us break the class here uh, for today and we will continue with other types of memory. So, we just seen today's class what are the, uh, the uh, why is memory important, what are the different types of memory and we have evaluated uh, just one type of memory. Also the existence of something called the single and multiple store system of memory. So, uh, in this present uh, section we just saw two different kind of sensory memories. We will continue the discussion in the next class. Thank you.